Okay, and then here's the main event here. So we've just made a lot of choices about how we model the system, how we discretize the system, how we solve the system, um, that are really like input parameters that have nothing to do with the physical problem. They have to do with how we discretized and solved the problem. Um, so um, we really need to verify that our solutions are correct after we get them. Otherwise, I would say that they are useless. Um, so step one is the easiest portion. Just look at the solution. Does it satisfy the boundary conditions? So um, when we did the, you know, we made a, a model that had governing equations and boundary conditions and initial conditions. Um, check to make sure that it actually solved that problem. And when you look at the solution, you can see that the boundary conditions are satisfied. This sounds stupid because, yes, of course, a, like a commercial finite element code is going to solve whatever boundary conditions you give it. But you know what? There's a lot of buttons when you type into these systems. Like when you go to set things up, you will probably forget like to set up a boundary condition or two since there are so many surfaces in a model. It's really important that you kind of just like twirl around your results and check to make sure that the boundary conditions you expect to be happening are actually happening. Um, and if they're not, you can go back in your model and look to make sure that you actually typed them in correctly and ask them to be solved. And if you ask them to be solved and they weren't solved correctly, um, that means there's a bug in the code. Um, so that is, that hope that doesn't generally happen with commercial codes, but um, if you're developing your own code, that can happen quite easily. Okay, um, so that's step one, is check to make sure that, this, the, that the results actually you know, look okay in terms of boundary conditions and the shape of the field that you solve for. Then check the numerical values. Check to make sure that they're the right order of magnitude. So like, you know, if you're expecting to get temperatures that vary between 300 Kelvin and 600 Kelvin, and then you go to do the solution and like the numerical output is, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 Kelvin, something probably went wrong. Um, so, and, and that could also, like, that could have to do with maybe the, you know, the properties of the material that you sent in. It could have to do with, you know, not setting up the boundary, not setting up the boundary conditions correctly or whatever. But you just want to go back and check to make sure that a simple hand model produces numbers that are similar to the order of magnitude that you're expecting. Um, if you can't actually make a model of the system that is like solvable, a lot of times you can at least do this using scaling analysis. You can figure out the order of magnitude that you're expecting to get. Um, so like generally you just want to make sure you're within about an order of magnitude of what you expect. Um, okay, then comes the more detailed part. So depending on what method you use to get the solution, you may have had to use an iterative solver to get that solution. So typically that'll definitely happen in computational fluid dynamics. If you're doing heat transfer, that'll happen if you um, have a, either a really large system or are using a nonlinear a model, like one that has temperature dependent properties or something like that. Um, if you are doing iterations, what you need to do is check to make sure those iterations are actually converging towards a final result, like a, a converged result. Um, so basically, there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, typically, like in a simulation, you'll define what's called a result control. So like, let's say that there's something you care about in a system, like uh, let's say I'm doing a CFD simulation of an aircraft and like ultimately what I'd like to do is calculate the lift on the wing, right? What you can do is you can just plot the lift on the wing versus iteration number. Presumably at some point, yeah, so initially when you're doing your first iterations, the, the value that it spits out for the lift on the wing could vary wildly. But eventually after I take enough, enough iterations, it should settle down to just a single number and eventually should converge to a number that is accurate out to many decimal points or stays the same to many decimal points every time you do a new iteration. So that's what you're looking for is to check to make sure that the answer, some answer that you care about um, stays the same versus iteration number. Once that happens, then you can move on to the next step. The next step is checking to make sure that you used a fine enough mesh. Um, so at some point we discretized the geometry um, into finite size chunks. Um, and that's true whether you do finite element method or finite volume method or even the finite difference method. 
Um, so you want to make sure you use the fine enough mesh to capture the thing that you care about. So again, like imagine that my job is to figure out what's the lift on a wing. So the way I would check this is plot lift, the, calcul the estimated or simulated lift on the wing versus some mesh size. So as I make the mesh size smaller, um, smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually what I should see is that the lift is independent of the mesh size. If it's not, things have gone wrong. Um, but you want to check that after, um, after iterations. 